What's up, y'all? Welcome to another edition of Purple Bear Biology. This is Professor Hurley, and today we get to talk about a portion of our central nervous system. This video is going to focus on our brain. Our brain is a super complicated organ with lots of different regions with lots of different functions. It's estimated that there are over 86 billion neurons inside of our brain tissue. As science continues to explore the brain, we have discovered that there are thousands of synapses per neuron. This is more connections than we have stars in our galaxy. Some individual neurons have up to 200,000 synapses. One region of the brain may be associated with one function, or one function may be associated with multiple regions of the brain. It's super complicated and cool, and so what we're going to try to do is have a conversation about the basic structure and functions of each of the regions of our brain. This conversation is going to revolve around dividing our brain up into primary pieces. The four major divisions of our brain are the cerebrum, the diencephalon, the cerebellum, and the brainstem. We're going to look at the functions of each of these, but first, let's take a look at the overall structure of our brain and the surrounding tissues. Starting superficially, you can see that we have a skull that wraps around for protection, but the outer part of our brain is actually wrapped up inside of protective tissues called meninges. You have three primary meninges that wrap around your central nervous system tissues. The most superficial meninge is called the dura mater. It is tough and leathery and serves as protection. The next two layers are called the arachnoid mater and the pia mater. The pia mater directly attaches to the brain surface. The space in between the arachnoid mater and the pia mater is the location where cerebral spinal fluid can circulate. Speaking of meninges and cerebral spinal fluid, no doubt you have probably heard of meningitis. Meningitis is actually inflammation that occurs in the meninges due to an infection. This infection could be bacterial, viral, fungal, or even parasitic. The basic effect is that inflammation occurs inside of the subarachnoid space. This impedes the flow of cerebral spinal fluid and deprives the brain of vital nutrients. Depending on the version of meningitis that we're talking about would determine the prognosis for the patient. Bacterial meningitis is treatable with antibiotics, but viral meningitis can be a death sentence depending on how severe the inflammation and infection is. Now, if we take a closer look at our brain, we can see that it's not all made up of the same components. In fact, you've probably heard of gray matter before, but what is white and gray matter? Well, here we can see that if we take a frontal section of our brain, that we have what is called gray matter along the periphery and white matter deep. Gray matter is primarily cell bodies from the neurons in our brain, while white matter is myelinated axons that are connecting to the different regions. One interesting thing to note is that if we look at our spinal cord, it is actually flipped. Gray matter is found in the deepest part of our spinal cord, while white matter is found along the periphery. Why in the world do you think that gray matter and white matter differ between our brain and spinal cord? It has to do with the function. So cell bodies are built to receive signals, while axons are built for sending signals. So it makes sense in our brain that because we want to be able to send signals between hemispheres in different regions of our brain, we want those axons in the middle. It wouldn't make sense to wire it all along the outside. This would take more tissue and be less efficient. In comparison, our spinal cord projects out into our peripheral nervous system. So it makes sense to have the myelinated axons along the periphery so they can connect to the peripheral nervous system and to put the cell bodies in the center so that they can communicate that information up to the brain. One cool thing about our brain is that it's not a flat surface. Instead, it has gyri and sulci. These are the crests and valleys that we can see in our brain structure that make it look wrinkly. Sulci are the dips and gyri are the ridges. Collectively together, these increase the overall surface area of our brain and allow us to have more regions and more surface area for functionality. Now, if we take a closer look at the white matter found inside of our brain, we can see that it's actually made up of different types of nerve fibers. We have commensural fibers, projection fibers, and association fibers. Projection fibers are fibers that bring information from our spinal cord and our peripheral nervous system up into the brain while commensural fibers allow our two hemispheres of the brain to communicate with one another. 
Lastly, association fibers allow different regions of the same hemisphere to communicate information and aid each other in different functions. While we're on the topic of all of these cool things about our brain, one thing that you may have noted is that we have a fluid called cerebral spinal fluid. This is associated with the blood-brain barrier. You may recall that astrocytes, the neuroglial cells found inside of our central nervous system, are associated with wrapping around capillaries forming a blood-brain barrier. The cerebral spinal fluid is actually secreted and filtered by ependymal cells and serves multiple functions including buoyancy, having the brain float instead of being crushed under its own weight on top of the skull. It also serves as protection and regulation of the chemical environment. Our brain tissue is delicate and requires essential nutrients to function. One of the primary reasons for the blood-brain barrier in cerebral spinal fluid is to avoid infection. Tight junctions seal up the area so that we do not end up with bacteria or viruses inside of our central nervous system. While the actual flow of cerebral spinal fluid is quite complex, it's important to realize that filtration occurs at the center of the brain and then the cerebral spinal fluid actually flows through spaces called sinuses. The flow of the cerebral spinal fluid is actually pretty cool. Moving from the center out, you can see that it bathes our brain in this delicate fluid that has been filtered and created for the sole function of providing nourishment to our brain tissues. Okay, so now that we have some idea of the different structures that wrap around our brain and the nourishment that takes place to give our brain the energy it needs, let's start taking a look at the actual parts of the brain. The first and largest part that most people notice when they look at the brain is the cerebrum. The cerebrum is the portion of our brain that's associated with higher level thought processes and can be divided into a left and right hemisphere. While these two hemispheres tend to be mirror images of one another, their associated areas found in the different regions are not always the same. Sometimes we have specialized regions that occur only on the left or right hemisphere. We'll take a look at some of these examples. But it's important to realize that none of these are set in stone. The plasticity of the brain means that each individual is quite unique. And sometimes regions that are found on the left side of a brain for one individual may be found on the right side of a brain for another. Here we can see the different regions of the brain divided up. You can see that conveniently the names of the different regions of the cerebrum are actually associated with the names of the bones that we learned inside of the skull. So we have the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, and the temporal lobe. Let's take a look at these in a little more detail. Here you can see from a superior view the different hemispheres of the cerebrum cerebrum and the breakdown of the different portions of the different lobes of the brain. Notice that there's a really long crevice that breaks the two hemispheres into two pieces. This is called the longitudinal fissure. In addition to the longitudinal fissure and the gyri and sulci that we can find around the brain, there are primary sulci and gyri that we can find associated with particular functions, sensory and motor. If we look deeper, we can actually see that our brain has essential pieces associated with movement, memory, and gratification and aversion. Now one thing to note as we're looking at all of these, typically when we think about the cerebral cortex, we tend to think of our left and right controlling the left and right part of our body. But actually, the fibers that connect to our brain from our, the rest of our body decussate. Decussate means that they cross. This means that the left side of the brain actually controls the right side of the body and the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body. This is referred to as contralateral organization. Okay, now before we start looking at some of the really cool lobes of the cerebrum, it's important to note that these lobes can be divided up into three primary functional areas. There are sensory areas that are associated with perception, motor areas that are associated with executing voluntary movement, and then association areas that plan and interpret sensory information that come in and decide which motor areas need to be activated in response. A good way to think of this is that if we see smoke, it's a sensory area that perceives this smoke with our eyes. We may even smell it using our olfactory cranial nerve. It's our association area that then recognizes the smoke and the smell of fire and correlates this 
to the fact that there is a fire itself. If the fire were close, it would be our brain's motor areas that then send the information out to our muscles to move our legs so that we can move away from it. Okay, so let's start to explore some of the really cool areas starting with the frontal lobe. Now the frontal lobe is associated with things like judgment, personality, and word formation. You can also see that our primary motor cortex occurs at the junction of the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe. We have a premotor cortex that is more anterior than this, that's an association area, functioning to figure out which muscles need to be utilized, and then it sends the information over to the primary motor cortex to disseminate that message out to the correct locations. No doubt, if we damage different areas of our brain, we get some dynamic effects. The frontal lobe is no exception. If we damage the frontal lobe, we get profound effects on what would be personality and judgment. You may have heard of Phineas Gage if you've ever taken a psych class. This is an individual that experienced a railroad accident where a spike was driven up through its fr his frontal lobe. Before the accident, Phineas Gage was actually a well-mannered and polite individual. However, after the accident, he experienced dynamic changes in his personality, where he became rude, vulgar, and impatient. You may have noticed this additional area called Brokoff's area inside of the brain. This is associated with word formation. If we damage this, we can damage our ability to form words correctly. When we damage Brokoff's area, this results in the inability to produce words correctly. Now note, there's no issue with their ability to comprehend. So the individual knows exactly what they want to say, it's just they cannot form the words correctly. Aphasia is what occurs when we damage a speech area of our brain. In this case, let's take a look at a video that shows us Broca's aphasia. Hey Mary Kay, what did you do this weekend? Went, party, Sister house. Oh, who was the party for? Nephew. Five. Aw, your nephew turned five? Aw, he's getting so big. You have to bring a picture next time I see you. So what else happened at the party? Balloons. Kids. Lots. Running. I love cake. Gotta have that cake. Well, that was good. I'm glad you had a good time. Hopefully next time I can make it. I'll see you later. So that's pretty interesting, right? Now, one thing to note is that this young lady was simulating brocosophagia. But you can see from her simulation that the individual understands the conversation. But she has slowed speech because she's finding it difficult to formulate the words for what she wants to say. This type of aphasia can be particularly frustrating for patients because they can comprehend the conversation and know what they want to say, but they don't have the ability to come up with the words as efficiently as they used to. Okay, so the frontal lobe's pretty cool, but let's take a look at the parietal lobe. So you may notice that the parietal lobe starts at the junction of the frontal lobe, and we start with a primary sensory area. Notice that it's a somatic sensory area. So this tells us that this is associated with sensory information that comes from things like our skin and our skeletal muscles. This allows us to detect things like touch, pain, pressure, and temperature. In addition to this primary somatic sensory area, notice that we have an association area too. So we perceive information that comes up through the primary somatic sensory area but it has to be sent over to the somatic sensory association area in order to interpret what it means. Now notice that there's another region at the junction of our parietal and temporal lobes called Wernicke's area. Wernicke's area is associated with being able to comprehend words that are spoken. So if we damage Wernicke's area, we tend to see an effect that is called Wernicke's aphasia. In this case, the patient doesn't understand that what they're producing doesn't make any sense. They appear to comprehend everything that they say, but their words come out jumbled, and they're not always appropriate for the particular scenario or sentence they're trying to formulate. Let's take a look at a patient that actually has Wernicke's aphasia. Hi, Byron. How are you? I'm happy. Are you pretty? You look good. 
What are you doing today? We stayed with the water over here at the moment and talked with the people up with them over there. They're diving for them at the moment. They'll save in the moment. He'll have water very soon for him. With luck for him. So we're on a cruise and we're about to we get to We will June, sort no? right here and they'll save their hands right there for and, them. And what were we just doing with the iPad? Uh, right at the moment, they don't show a darn thing. <laughs> <laughs> the iPad that we were doing. We, from, like here? I'd like my change for me and change hands for me. It would happen. I would talk with Donna sometimes. We're out with them. Other people are working with them with them. I'm very happy with them. Good. This girl was really good and happy. I mean, I played golf and hit other trees. We play out with the hands. We save a lot of hands on hold for people, for us, other hands. I don't know what you get, but I talk with a lot of hand for him. Sometime. Am I talk of any more to say in? All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, and I hope the world lasts for you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Bye-bye. Have a good day. So that's pretty fascinating, right? You can tell from the video that the individual has no idea that some of the words that he is saying don't make sense in the context of the conversation. So while this patient may have a more debilitating form of aphasia, it's less frustrating for the patient because they're not aware of the situation. Does this mean that these individuals are not aware that other individuals are confused? Well, of course not. They can often perceive, especially inside of family members, the frustration or confusion that they have, which can lead to frustration itself. But this frustration doesn't stem from their inability to come up with the correct words. Instead, it comes from the inability for people to understand what they're trying to say. Now, in addition to the Wernicke's area, if you damage portions of the parietal lobe, you can get a really interesting disorder called contralateral neglect. Contralateral neglect can be seen by these images of the clock, house, and plant. Essentially, the brain perceives only half of the image that it is seen. Now, to the patient, these images on the right look complete. However, they're neglecting about half of the image. Additionally, these types of individuals' contralateral neglect may only shave half of their face, they may only comb half of their hair, or only put makeup on half of their face. It's kind of an interesting, weird way that when we damage a sensory area, we can get damage to our perception of the world around us. Okay, so moving from the parietal lobe over to the temporal lobe, we find that it's primarily associated with hearing. Now, it also stores information for vocabulary and memory of familiar objects and faces. If we damage your temporal lobe, you can develop agnosia, which is the inability to recognize familiar objects. For example, imagine that you had a pen inside of your pant pocket. If you reached inside of your pocket and you felt it, you would know that it was a pen. However, if we damaged your temporal lobe, you may feel the object but not know what it is. Additionally, if we damage the temporal lobe, this can result in prosopagnosia. This is the inability to recognize familiar faces. This could be the inability to recognize your own reflection inside of the mirror. Imagine looking inside of the mirror and not knowing who was standing in front of it. Okay, so if we move to the posterior side of our cerebrum, we can see that we have our primary visual cortex, the occipital lobe. We have the primary visual cortex that's associated with sensory information of what we see and the association area that allows us to interpret that information. Damage to the occipital lobe can lead to some really fascinating disorders. First, if we damage the occipital lobe's primary visual area, we can get something called cortical blindness. So this means that the eyes basically function properly, but because the cortex has been damaged, it no longer perceives what the eyes see. Additionally, you've probably heard of hallucinations and illusions. Visual hallucinations can occur when there's no external stimuli. So imagine that a patient is sitting in the bed and suddenly they think someone is standing in front of them. It's open, empty space, so there's nothing that's actually stimulating it, but they see something there. In comparison, an illusion is where we take something in our environment and it becomes something else. An example of this would be if I put a ruler in front of you and you saw a visual illusion that made you think that the ruler was a snake. There is no snake, but you're using an object from your environment to create the particular illusion. 
Now, while we talked about all of these areas along our cortex, it's important to understand there are other areas as well. In particular, one thing that we didn't mention is that Brokaw's area and Wernicke's area tend to occur on the left side of the brain. When these occur on the left side of the brain, the matching area on the right side of the brain tend to have association with our ability to perceive information inside of conversations. For example, the area opposite to Brokaw's area is associated with emotional speech. So if we were to damage it, everything would sound monotone and there would be no expression in our voice. That would be kind of boring, right? Also, if we damage the area that's opposite to Wernicke's area, this tends to affect our ability to understand another person's speech and emotion. For example, if we damage that area, you may struggle to understand humor or even recognize sarcasm. Before we leave our cerebral cortex and move into the deeper parts of our cerebrum, one thing I'd like to mention is that you've probably heard of something like, oh, you're left-sided brain or right-brain-minded. Generally, when people say that you're left or right-minded, what they're really meaning is that you utilize a particular hemisphere more than the other. This is referred to as lateralization. Interestingly, men tend to have greater degrees of lateralization than women. Collectively, the left hemisphere usually is associated with things like spoken words and written language. This also also allows you to have analytical reasoning for things like science and mathematics. On the opposite side, your right hemisphere is usually associated with things like artistic skills, your ability to imagine, come up with stories, and recognize patterns. So now let's move from our cerebral cortex deeper into our cerebrum where we can find regions that are associated with memory and emotion. Your limbic system has two major pieces, the hippocampus and the amygdala. The hippocampus is associated with memory retention. If you damage the hippocampus, you'll experience something called amnesia. Amnesia actually comes in two varieties, anterograde amnesia and retrograde amnesia. Retrograde amnesia is what you experience when you forget everything from the past, whereas anterograde amnesia is what prevents you from developing any types of new memories. You may have seen this clip from 50 First Dates where an individual experiences anterograde amnesia. Tom. Hi. I'm Tom. Henry. Marlon. Doug. Lucy. Hi. Oh, those are cool flip-flops. Where'd you get them? You like those? It's an interesting story. I was over in the North Shore the other day. Hi, I'm I... Tom. Huh? Uh, Henry. Hi. Marlon. Tom lost part of his brain in a hunting accident. His memory only lasts 10 seconds. It was in an accident? That's terrible. Don't worry, you'll totally get over it in about three seconds. Get over it? I mean, what happened? Did I get shot in the brain? I... Hi, I'm Tom. Hi, I'm Lucy. Hi. Now, while that seems humorous, you can imagine the frustration that a patient may experience if they have no ability to form new memories. Moving from your hippocampus, we move over to our amygdala. This is the location that stores information for gratification and aversion. If you've ever had an experience that you now associate with a negative emotion, this is probably your amygdala storing this information. For example, if you've ever drank a little too much and now you had an aversion to the alcohol that you drank, for me this was tequila years ago, then it's your amygdala that is storing that information. Another example might be if you've ever had the stomach virus and now you don't want to eat the food that you had right before you got ill. This aversion is stored inside of your amygdala. In addition to our hippocampus and our amygdala, we also have basal nuclei that are deep within our cerebrum. Basal nuclei are associated with your ability to start and stop intentional movements. You've probably heard of an example of a disease that's associated with the inability to control movements called Parkinson's disease. Collectively, dyskinesia is exaggerated or unwanted movements that occur involuntarily. I should mention that Parkinson's disease is also thought to be associated with other regions of the brain as well, not just the basal nuclei. However, all of these portions of our brain work together collectively to help us give us motor control, and so deterioration of one region can lead to devastating effects in our ability to move around or cease movement. Now, one cool thing about our brain, sensory and motor areas, 
is that they are not necessarily proportional to the different parts of our body. In other words, regions that require more sensory input actually have larger portions of the brain associated with them. This is what you see when you look at this artistic rendition of portions of the brain. You can see that our hands actually have a large section of our brain that's associated with it, whereas things like our wrist or forearm actually have smaller sections. We can see the same type of specialization for our motor regions as well. Collectively, these artistic renditions of these proportions are called a homunculus. Okay, so now let's move from our cerebrum down deeper into the regions that have some of the most profound effects on our ability to just survive on a daily basis. We move into what is our diencephalon and the brainstem. Let's take a look at the functions of these. So your diencephalon can be broke up into two primary pieces. The thalamus, which kind of acts like the gateway up into the cortex. It regulates all of the information that will get disseminated and determines where that information goes into which lobe. And then we have the hypothalamus. Now the hypothalamus is actually a relatively small portion of our brain, but has a huge effect on our overall ability to maintain homeostasis. The hypothalamus has direct connection to our endocrine system and together collectively they can control our autonomic nervous system. This involves things like temperature regulation, whether or not you're thirsty or hungry, and in conjunction with your pituitary gland, regulates the hormones that get released around our body that can control metabolism, respiration, blood pressure, heart rate, anything that you can think of inside of homeostatic regulation. If we move from the diencephalon down to the midbrain, we find the section that is associated with movement, sensation, and some reflexes. Moving more inferiorly, we find the pons, which is associated with more voluntary muscle control, additional reflexes, and our ability to go to sleep and wake. Damage to the pons can be quite devastating. Damage to this area can result in something called locked-in syndrome, where the individual basically is aware of their surroundings and all of their cognitive thought is still functional, but they don't have the ability to move. The last region of our brainstem is the medulla oblongata. It serves a primary role in your regulating your cardiovascular system, your respiratory system, and your ability to perceive things like sense of touch, pressure, temperature, taste, and pain. It also helps you move things for forming words, chewing, swallowing, and controlling involuntary responses like vomiting, coughing, and sneezing. If we move from the cerebrum, we can move to the most posterior inferior portion of our brain called the cerebellum. The cerebellum's primary function is for something called motor learning. This is where you get the practice makes perfect. If you've ever shot a basketball repeatedly and gotten better at it, or practiced an instrument and your fingers eventually know the positions that they're supposed to be in, or even typing on a keyboard, all of this is regulated by your cerebellum storing the information for future use so that you're more efficient at those motor movements later. All right, guys. Well, that's it for this episode of Purple Bear Biology. I hope you enjoyed the crazy awesomeness of our brain. Our next episode is going to cover the spine and its general organization. So make sure that you hit that subscribe button and click the like button if you found this useful. Leave me a comment in the comment section if you want to go deeper into one of these regions or have questions about the functionality of some of these different regions. As always, I appreciate y'all watching, and thanks for stopping by. See y'all next time.